So hi, everyone, um, and welcome. We're here tonight for the second session of the Refurbishments Lab series. As part of Cherise Francis' poetic project, Quantum, Refurbishments Lab is an invitation for participants to be part of her research process over the course of several lab sessions and an open performance slash collection. Quantum is a poetic project exploring concepts of knowledge and knowledge making through Afro-diasporic centered research, looking at various Black and Afro-diasporic thinkers, writers, poets, and artists, as well as themes from STEM. Cherise will present um, research findings and works in process and invite each of you as participants to create your own response pieces. Our program tonight is made possible by the literary grant with the New York State Council on the Arts and Queens Council on the Arts. So as I mentioned, this is several, uh, one of several sessions of this series. Um, we even ran a, a poll on the, um, the question on a poll about this. Um, this is all leading up to in-person performance um, and gathering that will happen in December where participants are invited to come to the Lewis Latimer House Museum to um, you know, perform their own pieces. So um, your response piece does not have to happen in this workshop. It could happen after this workshop, but it could also happen during and after um, Sharice's presentation. So we invite you to, you know, uh, write anything that inspires you, um, you know, throughout Sharice's presentation that will follow my introduction. And also, um, you know, if you would like to just sit and process in silence, that is also an absolutely valid response. We just want to recognize that. So without further ado, I also want to introduce our facilitator tonight, Sharice Francis. She is an alchemist of the imagination and expresses herself through poetry, interdisciplinary arts, workshop facilitation, editing, and literary creation. Her work takes inspiration from her Afro-Caribbean heritage from Barbados and Dominica and studies in Afrofuturism and Black speculative arts, mythology, and etymology. Some of her work has been published in Furious Flower Obsidian, Epics Magazine, Bon uh, Bouquet, African Voices, and Newtown Literary. Additionally, Cherise has published three chapbooks Lucy's Bones Grows, Three Legged Elephant, Variations on Unsettling Seedling, and Recycling a Why That Rules Over My Sacred Light. And without further ado, I will pass it on to Sharice. Thank you, Roxy. And thank you, everyone joining tonight, um, especially from all over the world, I can see. Um, if you can't see me, I'm a Black person with a dark green shirt and glasses on, and I have locks, uh, dreadlocks as well. And so tonight we're going to be talking about sound and time. In the previous lab session, um, I discussed um, what is seeing and what is knowing using Lewis Latimer's um, uh, filament as a kind of inspiration. Tonight, we're gonna be thinking about time and sound through um, the inspiration is Benjamin Banneker. So I'm gonna share my screen. So while I present, feel free to take notes. Um, if anything comes to mind, feel free to either write it down in your own notes or share it in the chat. Um, and I will be reading through the chat at the end, as well as sharing some prompts to inspire you all for uh, sonic theorizing at the end. And so I'll give you a few minutes towards the end to write on your own and then share any ideas, questions, uh, further thoughts that you may have. So let us begin. When you are compressed into the darkness at the bottom of the ship, the other senses come into play. The roaring of the sea, the rocking back and forth of the ship, the croaking of the wood or ding of metal, the groans of bodies captured with you, twisting and turning in agony, the others whose languages you don't recognize. In the darkness of the ship, the sound reweaves you into another knowing. 
So this lab session, I want us to think about deep listening, to think beyond just seeing is believing, but what is hearing as believing? And the art you see below is from the art collage artist Romari Bearden. It's Africa Speaks to the West. And the poet who is on here, Kristen Hunter wrote, I am a dark room in me from my negative you were developed. So in thinking about deep listening, I got this quote from George Washington Carver. I love to think of nature as an unlimited broadcasting station through which God speaks to us every hour if we only tune in. And then I wanted to follow this up with a quote from Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. The clock ticked with an empty urgency, as though trying to catch up with the time. In the street, a siren howled. So this quote from Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man stood out to me in thinking about how the clock itself may not be the best way to tell time. But there are other ways to think about time especially if we're thinking about time through sound and what is heard. That the siren howling may be a more accurate way to think about time than the clock itself. And another quote from Invisible Man. I try to step away and look at it from a distance of words read in books, half remembered. For history records the patterns of men's lives, they say. All things, it is said, are duly recorded. All things of importance, that is. But not quite. For actually, it is only the known, the seen, the heard, and only those events that the recorder regards as important that are put down. Those lies his keepers keep their power by. So in thinking about that quote, I'm thinking also of another article I just read from Miriam Bahia Afrui called Time and the Colonial State. And in thinking about time and history outside of what is easily recorded, seen, and heard. Selective retelling of history includes deciding who is part of history and who isn't, and when. Official history is the dominant national narrative that aims to hold sole authority on events that in reality possess multiple accounts. The selected dates are, of course, always to the advantage of the national narrative. A bunch of notches on a timeline follow the march of progress demonstrated by an arrow moving from left to right, which represents past, present, and future, implicitly suggesting that writing in the other direction would be regressing, going against progress. The events on the timeline are discontinuous and detached from their constructive processes. The product of a superimposition of key dates is the illusion of a sum of moments in which nothing happened between the dates. A timeline speaks nothing of interstices. So in thinking about that quote from Mariam Bahia Afrui, I want us to think deeper about how sound can speak to those interstices, those in-betweens of time, the time that is not considered standard colonial time. The crick crack of history. Can one be free outside of what is heard? The official history 
the date of emancipation, the date of independence, runs on colonial time. Beyond the ticking of the colonial time clock is a freedom unheard. Re cluck 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 claiming my time. Our dates were long before that. So in thinking of Afroese mention of colonial time, I wanted to bring in black quantum futurism and finding out about terminology that is related to clocks. So in traditional horology, you have the terms master clock and here it's called secondary clocks, but their other term is called slave clocks. And slave clocks or secondary clocks are programmed to run on the same time as the master clock you see at the bottom there. So in thinking about the master clock and the slave clocks, it reminded me of what Afrui said about colonial time. The, as I say here, the superimposed standard rhythm of time, history, law, AKA, as Afrui mentions, the colonial metronome. So in thinking about this, a few questions came to mind. How do we connect points of time? How do we define time outside the standard and its violence imposed on us? That, as Afrui says, destroys, deforms, and suffocates history by enforcing a dominant temporality and denies collective construction of history in favor of a fictitious imaginary. Because these standards are often not responsive to what is actually happening in time. So in thinking about that, I thought about the phrase colored people's time or CPT. I thought, why not relate CPT time and kind of reclaim that phrase to represent a kind of computer? So in thinking about how language works and how there can be silent letters, I decided to add the M and R into CPT and make a computer. And CPT time as a computer collects multiple patterns, processes, or accounts of time to constantly reconstruct itself. It, as Afroe says, builds bridges across the ruptures of the colonizer. And like the siren mentioned by uh, Ellison, we are in constant state of emergences. All time is now. So in thinking about time, I wanted to move to Benjamin Banneker. Now this is an art piece from Amar Hutchins and he named it Banneker because that may have been the origin of his last name Banneker. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But Benjamin Banneker was a free Black man who lived before the founding of the United States. He was mostly self-educated. He stopped school at second grade. And he lived a life of study and curiosity while living on his farm in Maryland. He's considered one of the first horologists in America but also one of the first black horologists. He was known for deconstructing and reconstruction of a clock that he received. And he was able to see into the inner workings of the clock in order to create his own. So this is from, from the Banneker store. In 1751, Banneker borrowed a pocket watch from a well-to-do neighbor, Joseph Levi. He took it apart and studied its workings. He made a drawing of each component, then reassembled the watch and returned it, fully functioning to its owner. From his drawings, Banneker then proceeded to carve out of wood and large replicas of each part. Calculating the proper number of teeth for each gear and the necessary relationships between the gears, he completed construction of a working wooden clock 
1753 that kept accurate time and struck the hours for over 50 years until it was destroyed, along with most of Banneker's other belongings, in a mysterious house fire that took place on the day of Banneker's funeral. Benjamin Banneker has been credited for making the first clock to be built completely in America. So in thinking about Banneker, I thought about back to Imar Hutchins. He recently did an exhibition called Rifts and Relations. And I thought Rifts and Relations was a great idea to think about Banneker in general. First with his name, Banneker. So Banneker can have various possible meanings. Some have said that it might come from the Dogon in Mali or the Senegalese Wolof. It might be Arabic in relation and or Nilo-Saharan language. And the Bana part might have met a measurer or architect. And the Ka part might be related to the Nilo-Saharan idea of spirit. And I've extended it to the idea of what is observed or perceived feeling, the other, mindfulness, meditation, possession, and the list can go on. Um, Ron E. Glash, who is the author of African Fractals, also came up with his own theories as well, that Banneke may have meant the sweet place. Uh, Bannock or Bannock or Bane could, me could have meant palm wine or honey. And Banakas or Tanakas could have meant the belongs to the place. So these were other theories of the origin of Banneker's last name. And so I kind of fused all those meanings together to possibly mean the idea of a sacred or sound space, AKA the sweet spot. So the terminology, the sweet spot usually means the right timing of something timing where everything comes together, kind of like CPT time, the computer. And another idea I had was that Banneker might be related to Bantu or Ubuntu, which means originally the idea of a collective of people together. So in thinking deeper about Banneker, I also wanted to talk about his almanac because he wasn't just a creator of his own clock. He also wrote an almanac and he actually was in conversation with Thomas Jefferson who believed in the inferiority of the intelligence of black people. And so Banneker was of course infuriated by Jefferson saying these things. So he tried to send his almanac to Jefferson to kind of disprove this theory. And of course, Jefferson in his racist arrogance kind of shooed him off and basically claimed that uh, Banneker was an exception to the rule and later on even claimed that his white friends helped him um, with all of his experimentation and science that he didn't do it on his own. But of course that wasn't true. Uh, so Banneker's almanac, in his almanac, he was able to predict eclipses and other astrono astronomical events. He offered medical information and also the scheduling of various tides that he was able to predict. So Banneker was very much in line with the cycles and rhythms of nature. For example, he studied carefully the cicadas who show up every 17 years. And of course, we all are aware of the cicadas and their music. So he clearly would hear that a lot as well. So Banneker, the name Banneker, came from Banneker's grandfather, who may have been from the Mali, Senegalese area. And Banneker's grandfather may have passed down his knowledge that he knew to Banneker's father. And so it does make you wonder what kind of inherent inheritances of knowledge was passed down in time to Banneker. 
And referencing back to the Dogon, the Dogon are known for allegedly knowing about the Sirius star B without a telescope, which meant they relied on other kind of sensory information to know about the star's existence, which I think is interesting in thinking about, thinking beyond seeing is believing to other senses. And this is a song from a rapper that I'll put in the chat and you can listen to on your own. So in thinking of uh, Banneker's Almanac, let's look at another device that also thinks about time in a different way. The Astrolab. The Astrolab, um, which means to take the stars, was used as an instrument for astronomical uh, astronomical and astrological calculations involving the sun and stars. And the, this picture shows um, astrolabs from Cairo and Morocco. And so Banneker's work with the Almanac is very similar to how an astrolab is used. So in looking at the picture of the uh, astrolab here, I want you to keep that in mind as we think deeper about the clock be beyond just the screen of the idea of the clock. So a little bit more about Banneker's Almanac. In 1790, Benjamin retired from farming. He sold his land to the Ellicotts in exchange for some money and an agreement that he could spend the rest of his life living in his log cabin. Benjamin was finally able to give over all his time to his studies. He began sleeping during the day so he could watch the stars at night. He built a shed and carved out a skylight, turning the shed into a makeshift observatory. Benjamin constructed accurate tables and calculations. His work used as an advanced kind of trigonometry. Meanwhile, George Washington was making plans to move the capital of the young United States to what would be named Washington, DC. Andrew Ellicott hired Benjamin to work on a survey team that would lay down the original borders for the new capital. From February to April 1791, Benjamin's job was to note star movements and pass the information on to the survey team so they could very accurately figure out where the borders were by comparison with the position of the stars in the sky. Benjamin also contributed his photographic memory to the drawing of detailed maps and blueprints. Benjamin's first published his, al his almanac in 1792 and continued to publish them annually until 1797. So I just wanted to share a bit of history about his work with the stars, as, especially how it inspired the creation and the beginning of this country and how that's often not referenced in our history books and how you can't rely on just what is recorded because a lot of history isn't recorded as it originally happened. And so thinking deeper about how we can think of CPT time as a computer. This is an image of the quincunx. So the quincunx is kind of a crossroads image and it represents power radiating in all directions. Earlier I mentioned uh, Banneker's dream or drum writings. And in his dream journals, he would reference this image, this symbol of the quincunx, and it may have came from his Senegalese inheritance. And for me, this symbol representing power radiating in all directions, representing the crossroads, can also 
mean a kind of CPT time, a kind of computer time where various times harmonize and meet, and it kind of represents this living spirit of time. So in thinking about the crossroads, I wanted to reference this quote from Alondra Nelson's introduction to future texts. And she talks about the character Papa Labas from Mumbo Jumbo. And Papa Labas, his name is a reference to Papa Legba, who is one of the guardians of the crossroads. Rather than a Western image of the future that is increasingly detached from the past or equally problematic, a future primitive perspective that fantasizes an uncomplicated return to ancient culture. Labas foresees the distillation of African diasporic experience rooted in the past but not weighed down by it, contiguous yet continually transform. The anachronism that is an element of much of Reed's work is used to express a unique perspective on time and tradition. This effect is achieved and his writing through what he terms synchronizing, putting disparate elements into the same time, making them run in the same time together, such as approach is characteristic of how technology works in mumbo jumbo. Reed's synchronous model defies the progressive linearity of much recent techno-cultural criticism. As Sammy Ludwig has observed, Technologies exist independently of time in the novel. Though it is set in the 1920s, the story contains references to technologies that will not be readily available until years later. Reed's synchronicity extends to the placement of obsolete technologies in the present. Though not hardware as such, a communication technique called knockings is used by Papa Labas to receive information from beyond. Ludwig likens the knockings to radio waves, they could also be sensory perceptions, premonitions, or communiques from the past that lived through those who, like Labas, continue to make use of them. So in this quote from Alondra Nelson, I want us to continue to think about how sound can be seen as a kind of synchronizing of time outside of this kind of linear superimposition of colonial time that various times exist at once. So as we deconstruct the idea of the clock, I wanna reference these images that I got from Black Quantum Futurism, and it is a blinking eye clock. And the woman is Topsy Turby, who I mentioned in the previous lab session. And the man is, of course, a banjo player. And what I found interesting about these images was they had some of the figurines intact, but then other figurines had the screen, the front part of the clock missing. And you were able to either see the gears or you see that nothing is there. It's just a big gaping hole. And I thought, what if we can see time as those gears, much in the same way that Banneker deconstructed the clock to really understand the inner workings of time? And back to the image of the astrolab, the gears themselves also kind of look like an astrolab as well. So in thinking of the blinking eye clock, the living as a living clock. What's behind the screen of the clock? So I wanted to reference this song from Jules Santana. If you're a hip hop fan, you may know this song called Clockwork. Let's get on the grind like clockwork. Move that behind like clockwork. Keep it coming on time like clockwork. Get that clockwork, make that clockwork. You hear the sounds of the tick, you hear the sounds of the talk, you hear the sounds of the clock and get it right. So I like this song mainly because it makes you think about 
the idea of the clock differently, how the clock isn't just some outwardly device, but it represents time as a kind of thing that is embedded in your own body. And I'll put the link to the song in the chat if you want to check it out on your own. So in thinking differently about the clock, especially in relation to sound, I wanted to bring up another Queens musician. In the previous session, I mentioned Louis Armstrong, and we'll talk about Louis Armstrong a little bit later. But I wanted to mention another Queens musician, Milford Graves, who recently passed away. And Milford Graves was a drummer, and he believed in the idea of freeing the drum from the role of the metronome or a timekeeper. I'll read some of what he said. My research originates from the, a belief that music is a universal language and a curiosity to define the primary building blocks of that language. Graves explained in the notes to his recent ICA Philadelphia ex exhibition, A Mind-Body Deal, echoing the idea that rhythmic sounding is thought to have predated verbal communication. You can look at any culture's approach to music and find commonalities. Exploring these universals led me to, to what I believe is the common denominator, the human heartbeat. For Graves, to impose time on music was to miss the point. The rhythms are all inside for you to hear. And this is a description of Graves' performance. Watching Graves perform flanked by gongs and whistle in his mouth is a physical experience in itself. His drum kit, not an instrument to be played, but a being to be reckoned with. One of first to take the drum skins off the back of his kit to let the vibration spill out freely. Graves twisted and contorted rhythms with the agility of a gymnast. Sometimes he looked as though he was drumming in conversation with something unseen until he realized the dialogue was with his own internal nervous system. I thought that was interesting how he removed the skin off the drum and it makes me think of how this, the top part of the clock was removed from those objects we saw earlier, the blinking eye clock. The heart doesn't have the same length between each contraction and re relaxation of the heartbeat. The distance between bottom and the next bottom. If they are the same, that is extremely dangerous. And that was from The Power of Rhythm, Milford Graves and a Universal Heartbeat. And Milford Graves, um, towards the end of his life, um, he was having heart issues. And so he began working with uh, scientists to develop new technologies to help him deal with um, the issues he was having with his heart. So using cardiograms, lab use technology, and an array of increasingly sophisticated equipment, he was able to generate wave forms from heart sounds, subdividing and expanding segments to reveal the variations and oscillations buried like coded messages deep within the standard badum, badum, badum we recognize as our pulse. Writing algorithms to generate data visualizations and melodic sonifications, Graves gave shape to the variable vibrations of the human heart. In 2017, he co-patented a technology that uses heart sounds to regenerate stem cells. On a microscopic level, Graves had identified a single circular breath between the heartbeat, musical rhythm, and vibrating cells that form the basis of life on Earth. Mr. Graves has long said that a healthy heart beats with flexible varying rhythms that respond to the stimuli from the body. The rhythms, he said, bear similarities to some traditional Nigerian drumming styles, and he had fashioned some of his drumming approaches along these lines. So as you see in Graves' work, everything is interconnected. The heartbeat, the drumming, as well as 
the technology he created for healing his own heart. And all came down to synchronizing with his own heart and heartbeat. And recognizing the, as Afrui said, the interstices of time. A heart beating like a metronome is not a living heart, it is dead. And we can think about time in the same way. A time clock that just clicks like a metronome is not living, it is dead. So in thinking about sound in relation to time perception, I got this from Skidmore College. A sound that arrives at one ear a small fraction of a second after it arrives at the other ear provides us with information about the location of the sound source. Virtually every experiment in perception specifies how long a stimulus was exposed to observers, how long observers were allowed to dark adapt, which is your eyes adapting to the dark, the number of cycles that a sound wave completes in one second, or some other characteristic related to time. Most studies of time perception don't specifically involve auditory stimuli, but it's clearly that the case that time is crucial for audition. In fact, the durations that would not be perceived by our visual system have profound implications for our auditory system. The timing with which the notes are played determine the tempo or overall pace of the music, slow or fast. Just as Andrea Halpern, found that people had good memories for the typical pitch of familiar songs. She also found that people remember the tempos of familiar songs, although they were tolerant of both faster and slower tempos. Musicians can maintain identical tempos and still change the internal temporal organization of a song called meter or rhyme or rhythm. Even the melody itself is strongly determined by timing. Stimulus characteristics can have an important influence on duration estimates. A time period is judged longer if it is intense, complex, or segmented. So as this quote says, time and sound are linked together and how a musical piece is organized based off of time can change our feeling of that piece. So in thinking about how time and sound relate to one another, I wanted to bring up DJ Spooky. I mentioned multi-consciousness in the previous lab session. And so I wanted to talk about um, his book, Rhythm Science. And thinking of rhythm science in terms of polyrhythms and dismembering the clock and dismembering time through music and language. And here I reference the idea of the various meanings of clock. And um, I reference again, knockings from Papa Labas, but also thinking about how slidings and scattings can also be a way to think about time differently. And there is a way of measuring uh, uh, in quantum called qubits. And so I kind of wanted to create my own kind of unit of measurement of time or sound. And I call it quabits, or I kind of rearranged Banneker's name to quabana and further thought about it differently as a quant. So thinking of tonal languages. And with tonal languages, you can have various ways to hear a sound and that conveys various meanings across time and space. So I'm thinking of that unit of measurement as being all related sounds. They're just spelled differently. So in thinking further of that, I thought about, for example, the different meanings of pitch. 
A pitch can be a dark, viscous, sticky material like a sap or a tree. It can be characteristic of a sound or a tone that depends on the relative rapidity of vibration. It can be a throwing or a casting. It could be the angle at which something sits or moves. It could be a height or prominence or slope. It can even be manifesting or building. And it could be a moment in time when things come together. So in looking at those different meanings, you might be able to see how those different meanings relate to one another into a kind of larger picture of something. They kind of intersect even as they have their own meaning in of itself, kind of similar to the idea of the quincux. The intersecting or collecting of meanings becomes this singular word. And the same can be done for the word clock. Clock can be a device used to tell time. It can be to measure, observe, or gauge. It could be a perception of a moment or something noticed. It could be to be hit by something. It can even be like pitch to manifest, accomplish, or make something happen. It can mean to understand or realize. And last, the origin of the word clock itself. It was a bell and it made a clacking sound like clock, clack, clack. So I bring these two words up to bring up the point of how perceptions, how we measure moments and pockets of time can differ in various bodies, in various moments of time. Think of the story of Ahmad Mohammed, who's a Sudanese student who dissembled and reassembled his own digital clock. But instead of being celebrated, he was accused of creating a weapon because of Muslim profiling. So if this was a student of a different race, that student could have been celebrated. But for Mohammed, it was like a repetition of time. It wasn't a moving forward. It was a coming back in time, a referencing of past trauma and that kind of coming back, coming back and coming back again is something that is that cycling of time that I mentioned that before in the last session, that circular time, which is seen throughout the diaspora. So in thinking about sound and thinking about beat and thinking about the, the possible little interstices in betweens of time where we can possibly find freedoms outside of the colonial time, the basic unites of quantum, quantum like blues notes, like microtones, like micro times, like micro rhythms, the swinging beat and micro sounds. So some quotes from DJ Spooky on rhythm science and myth science. A catalog of undecided moments at the edge of my thinking process. Make the link between the names people make up and the image resolves. The game face moves from version to version. The logic is an extension rather than a negation. And I call that the prosthetic word. Kind of like tonal language, where you can add your own additional meaning and create your own kind of micro timing. Rhythm science, rhyme time, rough trade, sound. Think of it as a mirror held up to a culture that has learned to fly again, that has released itself from the constraints of the ground to drift through data space, continuously morphing its form in response to diverse streams of information. The more time you collect, the more information you collect, the more you can see various kinds of times that can sync together. The cluck, 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 claiming your time is a call, 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 as much as it is a 
response, meaning flows, changes, and shifts through time and space. As Spook, DJ Spooky says, form follows function, fact follows fiction. Necessity is the mother invention. There was a time when this computer did not exist as it does now. Language and music are like viruses. They scatter and spread and radiate and birth alternative times, AKA the prosthetic word. Humans have a certain perceptual architecture. The basic structure is the basilar membrane of the air, the sense of gravity and balance that we have come from there and the frequencies that we can or cannot respond to come from there too. I don't think we've engaged how much we can hear. We're conditioned to accept the social ramifications of the various technologies as constants in our environments, but they're as open to fluctuations as the societies that generate them. All of which point to the fact that it's not so much new ways of hearing that are needed, but new perceptions of what, can, of what we can hear. So in changing our perceptions of what we hear, I wanted to think about a recent broadcast I listened to from Afropop, the African roots of rock and roll. We think of rock and roll as a current musical art form, but rock and roll is not this simple musical art form that just exists currently today. It is a synchronization of many knowledges that have come before it. And this phrase from DJ Spooky, code is beats, is rhythm, is algorithm, is digital. Rock and roll is just an essential knowledge in different applications. Time is an archive of sounds and movements. From John S. Mbinti in his African Religions and Philosophy book about Zamani, deep time. It's the final storehouse for all phenomena and events, the ocean of time in which everything becomes absorbed into reality that is neither after nor before. So if we don't think of rock and roll as a current musical phenomena, but just in existence with all that has come before it and after it as well, we can think of the relations between the war whoops of the Mbuti group's call in the Congo and the modern field holler and the rock and roll scream or the relations between the string gourd instruments of the Senegambian region and the modern fiddle playing, the guitars and bass, and of course, the banjo player that we saw earlier, or the relations between the drums of the Yoruba and modern drum kits, or the relations between the melismatic singing of the Muslim singers of Mali and blue singing, or the relationships between the Congolese and Bantu bandpipes and the harmonica, the funk horns, the jazz saxophone, and clarinet. And so I've created some collage pictures to think of how we can think of time as not a linear thing, but as a synchronizing of many times together. So thinking of brass, and woodwind instruments in conversation with one another. In thinking of string instruments in conversation with one another. And that's Sister Rosetta Tharp at the left, who's portrayed in the latest Elvis movie, if you didn't know. or thinking about the drum and various kind of percussion instruments. And that's Milford Graves at the left. And that brings us to the studio. 
So Lee Scratch Perry had a studio called the Black Ark Studio. And Black Ark, of course, is in reference to the Ark from the Bible, the ship that survived the flood. And I wanted us to think about the studio as a kind of ship, especially when we think that the word studio comes from the word to study. And to study is related to the word knockings that we mentioned earlier with Papa Labas, that the repeated heartbeat, the repeated patterns over time, across time and space that create the sounds that we listen to. The repeated conversations over time and space. So we have Don Lee at the top here, top left, playing different instruments. We have the turntables in hip hop. We have Lee Scratch Perry at the top right in his Black Ark studio. We have Stevie Wonder and his work with the synthesizers. We have, gosh, why am I forgetting her name now? Um, uh, I'll look her name up later, my bad. But um, she's playing the two pianos um, and her playing the two pianos at the same time as a kind of studio work. And then we have the Hammond organ that's being played uh, here at the bottom, right? The organ as a kind of culmination of various instruments as well. So in thinking about how sound moves through time and space, how that relates to the creation of the word, when we have the word dub here, dub not just being a musical genre, but also the word itself. In ancient languages, dub being related to the creation of the word and also possibly being the heartbeat itself. Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Lub dub. So in thinking about the synchronizing of sound throughout time and space that becomes the word, let's continue to expand rhythm science. And through rhythm science, we come back to the ship. Earlier, there was the mentioning of circular breathing technique. And circular breathing technique is a common technique of musicians like Rosan Roland Kirk, where they stored breath in their mouth for later expression. They breathe through their nose and they hold it in their mouth until they are able to blow their breath through the instrument. And it reminds me of the circular instead of linear time, the time before the sound is made, the sound that was already stored in the body and is only recirculated after it's expressed. And then I think of tidalectics from Edward Kamau Brathwaite, who combined the idea of the tides, the sweeping back and forth motion with a speech pattern or dialectic. The image of an old woman sweeping the sand from her yard early every morning, who's in fact performing a very important ritual, which I couldn't fully understand, but which I'm tirelessly trying to. And then one morning I see her body silhouetting against the sparkling light that hits the Caribbean at that early dawn. And it seems as if her feet, which all along I thought were walking on the sand, were really walking on the water. 
and she was tra velling across the middle pass edge, constantly coming from ear. She had come from in her case, Africa, to spot this in North Coast Jamaica, where she now lives. Like our grandmothers, our Nana's action, Brathwaite says a little later, like the movement of the ocean she's walking on, coming from one continent continuum, touching another, and then receding, reading from the islands into the perhaps creative chaos of their future. That was from Tidalectics by Kamau Brathwaite. And so in thinking of sound, not as a kind of linear sense of time, but a kind of ocean of time that sweeps back and forth the waves of time, not progression or newness, but radiating in all directions already. And spectacles or moments just rise and lower like tides, like the vibrating skin of the drum on which the seeds of language are scattered and divine roots like waves rising up an alchema ship. So thinking deeper about words and times and sound, I found some interesting information about Louis Armstrong. That when he went to the Congo, they gave him the name Okuka Lokole, the person who rings the bells. And if you look at Okuka Lokole, it kind of looks like a stretched out version of the word clock. And so thinking of his name as a kind of stretched out time, an expanded sense of time, a radiating sense of time. And in thinking also about Graves' uh, movement practice, martial arts practice of Yara, and looking at Yara in the Yoruba language, it is the words for space, the words for acceleration, and also the words for children. And so it made me think of the pitter patterning link between space and time, AKA flow or flexibility. So back to Invisible Man. My hole is warm and full of light. Yes, full of light. I doubt if there is a brighter spot in all of New York than this hole of mine. And I do not exclude Broadway or the Empire State Building on a photographer's dream night, but that is taking advantage of you. Those two spots are among the darkest of our whole civilization, which might sound like a hoax or a contradiction, but that by contradiction, I mean is how the world moves, not like an arrow, but a boomerang. Beware of those who speak of the spiral of history. They are preparing a boomerang. Keep a steel helmet handy. I know. I've been boomeranged across my head so much I can now see the darkness of lightness. Now I have one radio phonograph. I plan to have five. There's a certain acoustical deadness in my hole. And when I have music, I want to feel its vibration, not only with my ear, but with my whole body. I like to hear the five recordings of Louis Armstrong playing and seeing what did I do to be so black and blue all at the same time. Sometimes now I listen to Louis while I have my favorite dessert of vanilla ice cream and slow gin. I pour the red liquid over the white mound, watching it glisten and the vapor rising as Louis bends that military instrument into a beam of sound. Perhaps I like Louis Armstrong because he made poetry out of being invisible. I think it's because he's unaware that he is invisible and my own grasp of invisibility aids me to understand his music. Invisibility, let me explain, gives one a slightly different sense of time. 
You're never not quite on the beat. Sometimes you're ahead and sometimes behind. Instead of the swift and imperceptible flowing of time, you are aware of its nodes, those points where time stands still or from which it leaps ahead. And you slip into the breaks and look around. That's what you he hear vaguely in Lewis music. The unheard sounds came through and each melodic line existed of itself so that clearly from all the rest said its piece and waited patiently for the other voices to speak. That night, I found myself hearing not only in time, but in space as well. I on not only entered the space, but descended like Dante into its depths. And beneath the swiftness of the hot tempo, there was a slower tempo and a cave and I entered it and looked around and heard an old woman singing a spiritual as full of Weltschmerz as flamenco. And beneath that lay a still lower level on which I saw a beautiful girl, the color of ivory pleading in a voice like my mother mothers as she stood before a group of slave owners who bid for her naked body. And below that, I found a lower level and a more rapid tempo, and I heard someone shout, brothers and sisters, my text this morning is the blackness of blackness. That's Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. In this quote, you can see that Ellison writes about this kind of compression of time and sound this kind of synchronizing of various memories and times just by him listening and deeply listening to sound. So in thinking about that, I wanna share with you a series of prompts. But before that, I want to share a little bit of a piece that I'm working on called Louis Speaks a Search Engine into Existence. And I was inspired by this from reading Louis Armstrong's memoir. And one of the scenes where there's a guy named Black Benny and Black Benny is drinking a bottle of ice cold beer. And Louis sa says in description of Black Benny, Google, 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 Google. I thought that was funny because I didn't realize that the word Google existed before the Google we have now. So I decided to start looking up the origins of the word Google. And Google comes from terminology that originally meant a very large number. It also was related to the idea of having googly eyes, so having very big eyes. And also the sound you make when you're gargling. Google, 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 Google. So again, in thinking about tonal language and the various possible meanings of language, I related it to a term that I've been creating for my own work called englitchalalia. So playing on the words English, glitch, and glossolalia, which means speaking in tongues. So I'll read what I have so far. When he saw Black Benny, Google, 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 after the bottle of beer was passed around, Google, 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 saw him drink that ice cold beer, Google, Google, Google. He said, I need a word for that. Google, 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 the sound of flow in his mouth. Google, 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 and down into his body. Google, 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 that not even the cold could stop him. Google, 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 he drank it all up, mouth and eyes wide open. Google, 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 Lewis said, I want a mouth and eyes like that. Google, 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 not even the cold can stop me. Google, 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 how do you take so much into your system like a gorge of a body? indexing an immense amount of data till it becomes la niapa, a good measure. A body of so many zeros, so many receptors, a spinning cricket googly. The index finger, key finger, counterclockwise, the turning back of the palm before you project the sound. 
becoming clockwise when it reaches the double slit gate. Surprise the beat man, black Benny Google with the goo goo googly mouth and eyes and a spark plunge ride in and out of history. So Milford Graves in his own work um, did a series of biofeedback techniques with his heart. And so I want to offer you these series of prompts to think deeper about sonic theorizing. And as Kame Ayewa from Black Quantum Futurism said, to be open to the sonic information left dormant in matter. And that includes your own bodies. So I'll just quickly go through the prompts and then I will put them in the chat for you all. And I'll give you about 10 to 15 minutes to pick at least one that you want to delve into more. So the first one is ask or ax. How does accenting or pronunciation represent the change of the meaning of a word in the body, in time, in space? And I have this as a question because when I was younger, I actually got made fun of because of the way I pronounce the word ask. I pronounce it ax. And um, I got teased because people were um, saying that it's supposed to be pronounced ask. And it wasn't until I was older that I learned that it doesn't matter how it's pronounced, that that is just a reflection of my accent, uh, specifically my Black accent. So, and it's a thing called met metastasis, where you just rearrange words and sounds, but there's no one right way to pronounce anything. So something to reflect on. Two, your presence is a search engine. Listen to yes, yesterday is tomorrow and read transcribing noise and sound is same by P Petero Kalula, Kalule. And in what ways does listening present itself? Three is from Drexia. Dr. Blofin's Black Storm Stabilizing Spears. I want you to think about what different times are you experiencing in the polyrhythms of this piece. Uh, number four is Anansi's Rhythmic Digitation, Kente Cloth Weaving. I want you to reflect on the pitter patterning rhythms of history involved in weaving a material materiality like kente cloth into space and time. How does these rhythms and sounds reflect the weaving together of material worlds? And in heart harmonics, I want you to write a score language for your heart and you'll see a bunch of information related to Milford Graves. So I'll post these in the chat. Oh no, one second. For some reason it's not letting me post. <laughs> Let me see if I try posting them one at a time. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so that's the first set of prompts. I'll just post them as I read them. So the next one is Bessie Smith, Backwater Blues. To reflect on the movement of water, the repeated cycle of floods and the sound of the blues. And I use this quote from Toni Morrison. You know, they straightened out the Mississippi River in places to make room for horse and livable acreage. Occasionally the river floods these places. Floods is the word they use, but in fact, it is not flooding, it is remembering. Remembering where it used to be. All water has perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it was. Seven, the knowledge of the groove, space and syncopated drum beats, the credit of the break, funky drummer who was named Clyde Stubblefield, who has been sampled numerous times in hip hop. And so I want this to be an opportunity to kind of plunge out of history or outside the groove of history as Hel Ellison wrote. And I quote James Brown because he said, the beat is the thing I did 20 years ago, but he actually didn't create the beat. It was Clyde Stubblefield, but Clyde Stubblefield doesn't get remembered as the person who created the funky drummer beat that has been sampled in all of hip hop and other genres of music as well. And here I put some additional thing to think about, remembering the ghostly impulses and inspirations of history that go unnamed. Your presence is a search engine for all those unnamed who make you who you are. How can you use sound imaging to find hidden cracks in dominant structures? Response. So this is some more Milford Graves. Um, if you want to listen to his sounds, lectures, ideas, and then write a response, a deeper response to his work. And I invite you to also create your own sonic theories. Next is um, a work called Time from Sudan Archives. And I want you to relate it to the previous calls before and continue to expand your search. This one's about Lee Scratch Perry. I want you to think about how is the music studio a sonic ship through space and time. If we think of a studio as a place of deep study, a place of repeated knockings, beatings, pressing, shapings, movements towards something, what is the ghostly call of this deep study for yourself? To board the ship? The last one, referencing the Ellison quote, what did I do to be so black and blue? Sound in the whole, the sounds and times recorded in the material of your body in the ground. Your presence is a search engine. And this is Ellison's quote, 
I was looking for myself and asking everyone except myself questions, which I and only I could answer. So this is a, a PDF of uh, Invisible Man that you can read on your own, as well as a clip of Louis Armstrong singing, What Did I Do to Be So Black and Blue? Feel free to listen to it at the same time that you're reading Ellison's work. So just want to give you a few moments before our time's up to explore these prompts on your own, what, whichever one is calling out to you. And then we'll come back. And if you have anything you'd like to share, any questions, any thoughts, then you can share them at the end. Just want to give you a little time to explore through these. So I'm going to stop the share.
Okay, just want to give you a couple of minutes more to continue exploring and then I'll start sharing some of what was said in the chat, as well as you can unmute yourself or share in the chat some of your own findings and realizations from tonight. Okay, so we're going to go a little bit over time, about five to 10 minutes. Um, if you have to leave, feel free to. This will be recorded so you can watch it later, but feel free to stay if you have the time to. Um, I'm just going to read a little from the, the chat, and then I invite you all to share what you, what you would like to. Um, also, the musician that I mentioned before that I forgot her name. Her name is Hazel Scott. So in case you wanted to know. Um, so MA mentioned um, what I said earlier about the clock itself may not be the best way to tell time. And I invite you all to create your own time device. How would you create a device that tells time for your own body? Suzanne Austin Hill said, enslaved persons had no clocks per se, yet time was kept measured and endured. Exactly, they had their own ways of telling time. And storytelling and music is also ways of telling time. Thank you, Damali, about mentioning CPT time as a computer. Um, Suzanne Austin Hill mentioned the Benjamin Banneker association bbamath.org. Damali said, the more I learn about Thomas Jefferson, the worse he gets, and he was already the worst. Yep. <laughs> uh, Francie mentioned Sun Ra and his solar orchestra, the 2022 Grammy nominee jazz big band category. They often cited this as a seminal source in their own cosmic trajectory, hence the band's name. Um, Francie, can you mention what the seminal source was? She left early, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Susan Austin Hill um, asks, what does the M and R mean? It was just me thinking about um, silent letters in language. And so I wanted to expand CPT time, colored people's time into the word computer. But M and R could mean other things for you if you like. 
Chantel Cornegay. I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, think of the blankets created by my ancestors who included escape routes in their work. So like quilting and quilting kind of being maybe like an almanac since it's, you know, the stars that uh, led enslaved people out into their own freedom. <laughs> uh, Cheryl S. Lynch mentioned biological clocks, right? Different types of ways we think about timing. Uh, she also mentioned a drummer with a heart rhythm issues finding the way out. Babette mentioned biofeedback as a means of providing access to brainwave visualizations as a means of controlling irregular irregularities in facial spasms. And that's good to know. Sounds as if it's um, Milford Graves, not Benjamin Banneker, was a uh, attempting to correct his heart irregularities by listening to his own heartbeat, a kind of biofeedback years before science was able to provide technology to this. Yep. Francie said the brain improvises every second of existence. That is true too. And Cheryl um, mentioned Hazel Scott. Yes, that's, that's who I was trying to think of. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Roxy Hazel Scott, too. <laughs> um, M.A. Dennis, um, what title? Is he still here? Yeah. But he asked, um, do you see any differences between Lewis and Louis? I thought you said Louis when you said the title, but it reads Lewis. I think that's how he spelled his name. L O U I S, not L O U I E. Okay. And yes, uh, Cheryl Lynch, uh, there's a song of that's the cartoon character I was referencing, Barney Google with the goo goo googly eyes. Instead, I changed it to Black Benny Google. Um, and Babette mentioned later. Eureka biofeedback, which seems to have been out there. We just have to be open to the possibilities. Keeping an open mind is key to understanding the world in us and around us. Yes. Uh, thank you, Simone. These prom prompts are dope. <laughs> and Damali also said, yes, a whole semester of work. You know me as, as well. I will give you a whole semester of work. <laughs> um. M.A. said that Morrison quote about water and that last one by Ellison, woo, powerful. Roxy said, agreed, it's 10 classes in one. And I'm still blown away by Milford Graves' story. Uh, thank you, Babette, so glad I tuned in. And same with M.A. Dennis. And Babette also said, the name Banneker reminds me of Beneke from the rare book collection at Yale. The names are pronounced very similar. The name seems to be of Saxon origin. Have no idea if there's any connection to Benjamin Banneker, but it does make me wonder. I will look up Beneke um, after and see if there is any connection. Thank you for sharing. And Babette also said, it is satisfying to learn and make connections with others who are seeking answers for unasked and unanswered questions. I had no idea that Jefferson was challenged by a freed Black man, but it makes complete sense. The irony of our founding fathers. <laughs> and also said, uh, Babette also said, Toni Morrison was given a grand tribute at St. John the Divine with thousands of admirers. It was an honor to be there. Wow, that's amazing. Um, Simone said, I listened to Louis Armstrong and Bessie Smith from Prompt 6 and 11. I immediately started singing, hearing the first song. And then while listening to Bessie and reading the prompt again afterward, I said I wanted to insert my memory and thought of different words like awaken, heal, tend. I'm a futurist and tend to be really future oriented, even though it's all the same. But I would like to remember more, ground more in past references. Mm. Do let me know of your work with that, Simone. 
And Cheryl said, the heart is not a metronome. What about the expression, my heart skips a beat? Well, that goes back to um, what I mentioned earlier about be, the heart being responsive to the environment around it. It doesn't work like a metronome. So anything that happens in our lives, your heart immediately will respond in changing its beat. And back to response again, Mavette says, call a response. It's good that you read some comments from the chat. It's a way of being part of the drum circle. Knowledge is about conversation and all of you are part of the conversation with me. And thank you all. And if anyone would like to share anything, you feel free to unmute. Uh, and thank you, Damali. My mind does a lot. <laughs> um, Suzanne Austin Hill said, I just listened to a bit of Black and Blue. Lyrics are sweet, sassy, and like a slow, slow dance. My gut response to the prompt, be born in the random assignment of skin color. Mm. Interesting thought. Something to think deeper about. So feel free to share any more thoughts or questions that you may have. You can share in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. Damali asks, is it random or pre-embodiment choice? <laughs> Maybe a little bit of both, like I mentioned about quantum. <laughs> Hi, Siobhan. Siobhan says, thank you for introducing us to this amazing list of resources. So much interesting areas to continue to explore. Yes, and please continue to explore them on your own. I will share the PDF of the um, presentation afterwards so you can continue to explore the ideas on your own and feel free to email the museum or if you have my contact email me with any other ideas or creations that you're coming up with as well because at on in december i'm doing a performance and i invite you all to be a participants in the performance as well with your own works and creations um it's technically in person, but we could do a virtual one if that's also possible. <laughs> Roxy? I think it can be incorporated because um, if we do some form of like a Zoom, you know, and, and then we can have folks on the Zoom to also present their work. Because I know oh. not everyone is in New York, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we'll make, we'll make something happen. <laughs> So I'm it, just gonna, sorry, I'm just sharing these uh, links here. Uh, so it has our website, um, you know, if you want to sign up for our newsletter that like keeps you updated on all of the different events aside from Reversions Lab. And I also put the <laughs> next sessions uh, registration link there, um, but it will be the same Zoom link. So if you did want to join us, you can just use the same Zoom link. To, um, it's the second Wednesday of every month um, until December. Um, and so, you know, we'll love to have you guys back again. Yeah. Yes. Thank you all for joining and I hope to see you all next time. Thank you, Cherise. Happy belated birthday. <gasps> Thank you. <laughs> Happy belated birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming and I hope to see you all next time. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night. Bye, everyone.